I'm Ofi, and I am recording this within just a few days of the Quiet on Set documentary coming out. For future reference, since I'm sure that Quiet on Set is not going to be the only notable Nickelodeon tell-all documentary in the next few years, Quiet on Set was released across two nights and four episodes. The first two episodes primarily featured interviews from cast members from All That, an early Nickelodeon Dan Schneider show. These cast members and some of their family members who were part of the documentary as well detailed horrific working conditions. Racism, sexism, there are interviews from two staff writers who were asked to split a salary, almost certainly because they were women, because there were men there who were getting a full salary. For people like me, who have done research into Nickelodeon via other people's passion projects on the subject, this is something that has been a long time coming. I follow quite a few different sources and have in the past followed sources that I'm a little bit less likely to recommend for a deep dive, and I've made a playlist below of some of my favorite YouTube videos that have handled a lot of the similar subject matter to what was in Quiet on Set. For example, I think a lot of the information that was given about Brian Peck was handled incredibly well in the deep dive video about it, especially considering how much less information they had at the time compared to what is now known about that case. I'm also, and this probably isn't a huge surprise if you noticed that the first big video that I uploaded was like three hours long, a pretty big fan of Quentin Reviews, and I found him by watching the I Binged iCarly video out of context and then have backtracked and watched that whole series beginning with Fred multiple times. I also, of course, have read Jeanette McCurdy's book, I'm Glad My Mom Died. Prior to that, I had listened to her old podcast, Empty Inside, and I've listened to quite a bit of her new podcast, Hard Feelings, which just recently wrapped. I've mentioned this in previous videos, but I grew up homeschooled and pretty heavily sheltered. My family didn't have cable television for a few different chunks of my childhood, either because of religious convictions that came and went as they suited my mother or because of financial issues and just not being able to afford cable. So my experience with Nickelodeon, definitely, I've had more fascination in what I've learned about it after the fact compared to having seen a handful of individual episodes of iCarly whenever they were rerunning. Which is all to say that I walked into watching that Quentin Reviews series not really thinking that I was going to have much of a memory of anything. But a lot of the things that are pointed out in the Quentin Review series are kind of a slow boil to his refusal to name Dan Schneider for most of the beginning of the series. What that means is that for years, Quentin has been building to this rolling boil that kind of culturally happened while he was still working on this very intricate and time-consuming project. I've seen him state on his Twitter that he's concerned that the whole bigger picture of the tone shift in his upcoming video will be lost because of the context of quiet on set making it seem like he stumbled into a bigger, deeper conclusion. And I don't think that anybody who's actually watched his iCarly series would think that. It's been very clear from the beginning that he's had an intention of addressing things at some point, and I don't think that the fact that he took his time to get there means that Quiet on Set will be remembered more fondly than his series, because I think his series, like a lot of the really thoughtful YouTube content, is better than Quiet on Set was. I think Quiet on Set is sensationalized, and that would have been expected especially for this kind of subject matter or like a true crime documentary. But I also think that it's pretty intentionally misleading in a couple of ways that I would like to talk about. You can find a list in the description box below of what the particular subject matters that I would give a trigger warning for are. I do also want to make a note that I will be using actual words 
I don't know what that's gonna do to my video in terms of the algorithm, if that's even like a real consequence, but even if it is, I think more is lost in saying things like grape and broom than is gained by having wider appeal. So I'm gonna talk like an adult. I think there are a lot of reasons that Quiet on Set is like this, right? On the one hand, there's the fact that there is so much to cover. There are people who were mentioned in Quiet on Set who weren't actually interviewed for it and who have stories that would take up several episodes just on their own, right? There are several different kinds of misconduct. Multiple different sex pests are named and exposed in this documentary. A lot of the media coverage, though, around Quiet on Set, both before and after the episodes finished dropping, was about one case in particular. This is a case that was already well known. Again, like I said, there's a really excellent deep dive video about it here on YouTube. This is a case that everybody who was aware that shady things had happened at Nickelodeon knew had happened, but nobody knew who the minor in question was until Quiet on Set. I have seen, and not in that deep dive video that I recommended, but just elsewhere online, I had previously seen speculation that it was Drake Bell, but this is the first time that Drake Bell has come forward and shared his story, and that is something that has been very heavily marketed upon by the people who have been promoting Quiet on Set. That's something that I have gotten several push notifications to my phone about over the course of the last couple of weeks. It's something that Alexa Nicholas of Eat Predators has been very heavily platforming the story of. And it's something that I think was presented in a way that makes me uncomfortable. Before I go any further in criticizing any of this, I want to say very plainly that I think that what happened to Drake Bell is terrible. What he described is monstrous. I believe his story, I believe what he said, and I believe that he had a right to share that story. I, however, also have a right to be a bit uncomfortable with the way that that story is now being used to silence more narratives that are less beneficial to him. Let me explain what I mean here. I've seen a lot of tweets this weekend that have claimed completely baselessly that the rumors of Drake Bell were dispelled. Not meaning that they are questioning the story that he put forward in Quiet on Set, but meaning that they are questioning the story that has been put forward by victims of Drake Bell. I am linking below to Twitter threads that have more information about the allegations that have been made against Drake Bell by his ex-girlfriends, and I recommend that you read them, but that you also go into them knowing that they're incredibly heavy. The way that Drake Bell has treated former romantic and sexual entanglements, the way that he behaves with women, we have a really well-documented pattern of that already. And I'm very uncomfortable with the way that it was papered over in the documentary. On the one hand, I do kind of understand why they wouldn't have played hardball with him in that interview. You have this traumatized former child star trusting you and your documentary to be the one to break the details on this huge story. Of course you're going to play nice with him. I also just take issue with the way that because we had heard from former stars who had gone through abuse and trauma on the sets of these shows and who have said, oh, this impacted my life because I made bad decisions. This destroyed my relationship with my family. This made me have a hard time with alcohol and drugs. All of that really set the scene for what we were able to believe once those allegations were brought up for half a second and then wallpapered back over in Quiet on Set. Do I believe that Drake Bell was traumatized and victimized as a child? Absolutely. Do I believe that Drake Bell then went on to traumatize and re-perpetuate that victimization of other children? 
yeah, I do. There are too many different accounts from too many different women. There is a plea deal that he accepted, probation that he didn't finish serving. All of this points again and again to me of somebody who does not get hurt, learn the lesson, and then not proceed to hurt other people. Somebody could make a documentary right now and delve into the past of the man who victimized Drake Bell, and we might learn that that man was traumatized and victimized as a child. And if that's the case, likely so was the person who did that to him, and again and again and again. At no point in tracing back the origin of why somebody might continue to re-victimize other people does that negate the trauma that they themselves have given to other people. Not only that, but I don't think that the trauma is what makes somebody abusive. I feel a huge amount of sympathy for what Drake Bell lived through as a child. But I also feel a huge amount of sympathy for the children that he victimized once he was an adult and he was the one in a position of power and influence. It's a misunderstanding of what allowing somebody to grow is, to recategorize somebody from perpetrator into victim, and not be able to see the nuance where it's possible to be both. Alexa Nicholas was featured in the documentary and has been very outspoken about her trauma from working at Nickelodeon on Zoe 101. I have a huge amount of respect for Alexa. Respect that is deeply challenged by some of her recent behaviors, and I want to talk about that without completely dismissing the work that she's done or her intentions as an advocate. She had a lot to say about responsibility and accountability and calling people in when she was upset with Christy Carlson Romano for deleting her episodes of the podcast, and I think that a lot of that can be reapplied here. I also have a really excellent video recommendation in the comments below about the whole Alexa Nicholas, Christy Carlson, Romano situation, so I would definitely suggest watching that to have kind of a fuller understanding of what I'm saying if you don't really remember that. Because Alexa Nicholas has been making some interesting choices since the documentary was released. I'm far from the only person to have these observations. A lot of people have been directly criticizing her for it on Twitter and getting blocked for it. Starting before the Quiet On Set documentary was released, when the information that Drake Bell was the big bombshell guest on the show dropped, Alexa began to cover it on her YouTube channel. Alexa's YouTube channel is called Eat Predators, and it's somewhere that she live streams a few times a week to give updates and talk about her protests of Nickelodeon. Parts of these streams will then be cut up and uploaded as individual videos, sometimes for extra engagement. Alexa has been very fixated on covering this story, which is something that longtime followers of her, like myself, have found a little bit eyebrow raising considering the fact that as of last year, Alexa was making videos about the allegations against Drake Bell. Alexa has since privated those videos and said in a statement on Twitter that she has been given all of the full documents to do with the case, a case that has apparently been sealed in court at Drake's request when he took that plea deal for endangering a minor. She says that she needs to go over them thoroughly and that she will be doing deep dive videos in the next few weeks. I do want to state, again, like I said, I'm being critical of Alexa here, that hasn't been her previous take when she's been presented with information. Often she will read an email and react to it as if she hasn't previously finished looking through it. I have respect for what she's been outspoken about in the past, and I don't say any of this to take away from what she has lived through or what she is trying to do. But I do think that a more responsible thing than to suddenly backtrack on having previously sided with victims would have been to leave the video up, 
to not cover Drake in the future, either negatively or positively, if you were taking the video down. Or to come right out and say whatever the underlying circumstance is here. Because I have a feeling it might have been, hey, Drake and his team asked me to private that video. And if that's the case, I think that's information that, like, for me, would challenge a lot of people's respect for what Alexa is doing. So that's not being said outright. This is just straight up an allegation. I have no evidence for this. It sounds to me as if by saying that she had suddenly come into possession of all of these sealed court documents after cozying up to Drake Bell on the timeline, not that she has directly had him on her channel, but at the time of me recording this, she has read a statement that she seems to have gotten directly from him and asked his permission to read. She has been participating in a lot of coverage about other celebrities who had written letters in support of Drake Bell's abuser at the time of his court case. Even if she has not directly received money from Drake Bell's team to rehabilitate his image, she has presumably been making money based on the fact that the Drake Bell thing is the largest piece of clickbait to come out of quiet on set. This is extra frustrating for me to watch because I appreciated how much on the right side of the Amber Heard and Johnny Depp case Alexa Nicholas was. To see a tone shift that specifically once it's somebody who is running in a similar circle to you and let's be realistic might put a lot of extra eyes on your channel and on the advocacy that you're doing it's disappointing and i feel bad to be disappointed by alexa i think she's doing the best that she can with a lot of what she's trying to do I think a lot of what she's doing, though, is a lot more emotionally motivated than really people look for for leaders in activism the way that she's presenting herself as being. I don't mean to say this to infantilize a woman who is older than me and has children, and maybe the fact that I'm talking about this at all is inherently kind of me being paternalistic, but... It does feel, in a way, as if we are watching Alexa be groomed. Either into getting this validation, going on CNN, once her whole thing is that she's taking up for Drake Bell and talking about how horrible what happened to him was. Being groomed either into the validation that you get as a woman when you very publicly side with male victims to the exclusion of their female victims or being directly groomed by whatever is happening with drake bell and his team behind the scenes however she's getting those documents and being persuaded to private her videos i have seen alexa nicholas talk about darvo Darvo is, if you're not familiar, a pattern of behavior that is done quite often by abusers. Deny, attack, reverse victim and offender. If we look at the course of what Drake Bell is doing, what the fans of Drake Bell are doing in the comment sections underneath Alexa's videos where she is acting as if Drake Bell is only a victim, as if there is only a black and white of predator or victim, and as if as soon as he moved out of the predator status, he became untouchable, unable to victimize anybody else, in dire and absolute need of radical forgiveness and empathy. Empathy that is not being extended to his victims, who are being called liars. His victims who were children, who were little girls who he abused. And I, of course, understand the outrage that especially Alexa, as somebody who was in the industry at a similar time to Drake Bell, would feel thinking about Drake walking into that courtroom and seeing it full of people there to support Brian Peck. 
But I just can't get it out of my head that we, by all circling around Drake Bell, as soon as we have heard one side of a story that makes him look like a victim, are doing the same thing to those girls who are victims of Drake Bell's. We are showing up publicly for their abuser, for somebody who victimized them and put them in danger, somebody who pled guilty to that and who managed to get a documentary to frame all of that in the softest, most gentle way possible because he also talked about his trauma during it. Being traumatized does not make you abusive, but it also does not and cannot absolve you of your abuse. To pretend like it does is a disservice to the survivors of the victim that you're buddying up with. I think that spaces for survivors are a lot better served by figuring out how best to protect their sheep than to figure out exactly how far into a wolf a sheep might have been able to turn into and still hang out with the sheep. A lot of the imagery and the language around heat predators relies on this dichotomy, and that dichotomy is so ripe for somebody who wants to darvo who wants to reverse victim and offender, who wants to come in and flip themselves onto the other side of the coin. But what happens when they're on that other side of the coin? Not only do they get the financial benefit, something that I'm assuming that Drake Bell is hoping for, given that he launched a music video concurrently with the documentary, but they also get access to people who are vulnerable people who are survivors, people who have been previously victimized. And not all of those survivors go on to abuse people. I would venture that most of them don't. We know of other child actors who have had terrible, averse experiences and who have not taken that out on other people in a way that they've had to take a plea deal about. Even if Alexa wants to support Drake Bell, it would be more supportive of more survivors, just thinking in terms of utility to say, Drake Bell shared his story, and you can see it in the documentary if you would like to. And Drake Bell also has victims who have shared their testimonies. And as I feel like I'm in the middle because I am in this documentary with him, I don't feel personally qualified to continue to cover it. But there's not really enough room for that when everything is big, cutesy, red mouths and t-shirts and live stream super chats. This commodification of victimhood is only going to continue to be more and more blatant, and even people who we might think have pure intentions are going to be maybe unwillingly commodified by other people who see what a benefit it is to have somebody who points themselves out as the arbiter of who is and isn't a predator personally absolve you of your wrongdoing. I really struggle to specifically call out Alexa here because this is also something that the documentary did, right? This is also something that we always do when we have somebody who we can attribute a traumatic backstory to what they did. But it's been making me feel deeply uncomfortable over the last few days to see people act like just because he got a puff piece made about him in the middle of a documentary, he has been suddenly absolved of what he did. And I don't want other survivors to feel like they are going to be immediately discredited just because somebody finds out something bad that happened to somebody who did something bad to them. I am very sorry for what Drake Bell lived through. And I am very, very sorry for what every young girl that he preyed upon had to live through. And I am very, very sorry for the fact that they keep having to see themselves be referred to as debunked and liars when that is not what happened. Making this video probably is going to attract people who want to tell me that exact thing or who want to tell me that I have no place to criticize Alexa. And that's fine. You can think whatever you want to think about the videos that I make, but I'm talking directly to the people who need to hear what I say. I just want to talk directly to the people who do need to hear this, that you're not crazy, that it is driving me up the wall too, that I feel really uncomfortable with this, and that I feel like this might be another situation on the precipice of turning into a 
Johnny Depp bot farm situation. Push back on it. Let other survivors know they're not crazy. Have solidarity with people who don't continue to turn around and re-victimize other people as soon as they have a smidge of power over them. Have empathy for people who are victims, but let it end before you expose other people to somebody who will traumatize them. People who have not actually shown the capacity to grow are not automatically entitled to forgiveness as if they have presented that to you just because you heard about the worst thing that happened to them. Let me know what you thought. Let me know if you would like to hear more from me on this subject. Let me know if you think that I was too hard on Alexa. Again, I'm not saying she needs to stop doing what she's doing in general, but I am saying that I would like to see more of an understanding from her of what her position as a leader in this space means if she wants to continue to be a leader and not just somebody who does consider themselves an activist. Because there is a very big difference between an activist leader and organizer and somebody who doesn't have the kind of responsibility that she has that she's been asking for. I had been crossing my fingers for her that she would get Allison Stoner and Jeanette McCurdy on her podcast eventually, but I am struggling to see that happen if she continues to align herself with Drake Bell the way that she is, and I'm kind of wondering if she's aligning herself with Drake Bell the way that she is because that hasn't happened for so long. Other people in Hollywood have been very mean to Alexa. Again, I do feel like this is in some way similar to grooming. I'm not at all surprised that she wants to hear him out and that she wants to give him the benefit of the doubt. But I think at this point, knowing what we know about his victims and their testimonies, that it is irresponsible. This is definitely my most current events -y video so far. Uh, if you liked it and want more from me like this in the future, let me know. Let me know in the comments if there's anything else you'd like me to talk about, anything that you found particularly misleading or manipulative about Quiet on Set. Or like if you didn't think there was anything suspicious about this Drake Bell campaign and you're willing to be civil about that, I also will hear that out. Thanks for watching and for hanging in there with me. This is kind of a heavier topic uh, than the other sleepover style videos that I've been filming recently. Thanks for watching. I hope you have a great rest of your day, night, whatever time it is. And uh, if you liked hearing me pick stuff apart, maybe subscribe because I do that a lot about a lot of different things. But uh, that's it. That's the video.